My name is James Dickerson. I'm Billy Van Alstein. Danny Dean Thomas. My number is 983. 999-000-764. I'm 37 years old, 22 years old, 43 years old. I fell out of Dallas County. I fell out of Grayson County, Texas. I've been here seven and a half months. Used to, when I first got here, when an individual was executed, uh, nobody would eat. Nobody would go out to recreation for that day. And it's completely changed around now. You don't even, it, it, well, I guess it's just gotten so common that people expect it anymore. It seems like, well, you know, he's at least not suffering anymore. He's gone. As is Jesse Jacobs, gone. His case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and in a highly controversial split decision, the court ruled against him. He was executed on January 4th. The 86th man to die in the Texas death house since 1982, when Texas resumed executions. Since that time, there has been somewhat of an evolution in that, uh, unless it's uh, an inmate that may have some sort of notoriety or has really been played uh, high by the press or his case is uh, something that is sensational, uh, very seldom do we have uh, the crowd outside. Days before he was executed, we asked Jesse Jacobs what he thought of the death penalty as a deterrent. To the individual they're executed, they'll never commit another crime. But as far as people on the streets, nah. Kids on the streets say, well, the state's killing people every day. They're justified in doing it. We can do it, too. You know, you can't tell me I can't do something when you do it and get away with it. So is it a deterrent? No. Less than 90 minutes from now, another man is scheduled to be executed. Mario Marquez would be number 87. I'm prepared, you know, for my journey home. And I'm not worried about it. I'm not depressed or nothing. I feel I have the peace in me of the Lord, you know. Almost everyone directly involved in the process seems to have found some way of coming to terms with it. The condemned and those who are charged with carrying out the sentence. If the law calls for us to strap him down, we'll strap him down. But if the law tells us to unstrap him, we'll unstrap him as fast as we strapped him down. Uh, because that's what our job is. And we are only, only the, the instruments and the people that cause this, this particular sentence to be done. Running penitentiaries is Huntsville's biggest single industry. Carrying out the capital punishment that the courts of Texas are handing down with increasing regularity is an important subcategory. There are 400 inmates currently on death row here. 17 of them are scheduled to be executed by the end of March. The men on death row are segregated from the rest of the prison population. So once a week, they can place an order with the prison commissary and get what amounts to room service. You got two ladies in chief. For the past 15 years, Chaplain Carol Pickett has been ministering to the spiritual needs of the 1,600 inmates at the Walls Prison in Huntsville. The most difficult and perhaps the most important part of his ministry is the time that Chaplain Pickett spends with condemned inmates during their last hours before execution. Jesus loved those people. They may not have accepted him, but he loved those people. You told me a moment ago it wasn't in the job description. But when you found out that it was part of the job, what was your immediate reaction? I don't want to do this. It, it's, it seems sort of a surprise to all of us. Of course, Texas hadn't done it in so long. And I came to work here in 80, and nobody even thought about it. Uh, we, nobody thought it was ever going to happen. And then when in 82, when the warden called us for a meeting, and we went through our first walkthrough, I, I didn't like it at all. Has this made you a better man? Absolutely. Because? I've seen men who've grown tremendously. I've seen people who, who might have done things that Everybody 
might have considered to be tremendously wrong. But if there is such a thing as true repentance, and I believe there is, I've seen that. Do you dread these days? Dread is not the word. I'm very concerned about each man. Even before he gets here. I don't know the man before he comes here. I don't go to, to death row. This was set up as our procedure back in 1982. So you've never met Mario Marquez? You'll meet him for the first time in an hour or so. And that was the procedure that was set up and and we recommended. I would find it very difficult to work with a man for years and years and deal with his family and help him with his correspondence and help him worship on a regular basis and then have to be in this position. How long does it take you to get over it? I mean, when you go home at uh, 2 o'clock tomorrow morning or whenever it is, you, you get to go home. Can you go to bed right away? No. I somehow myself haven't gotten over with. Some of them, and, and I'm not going to be specific, but some of them, I have had things inside here that will be there forever. And, and when it gets to the point where I can get over it by 2 o'clock in the morning, I'll quit. It's known here as the death house. Six cells, although no more than one has ever been occupied at a time. The actual room in which the executions take place is small and antiseptically clean. A crisp, fresh sheet has been tucked around the gurney. There are two arms extending from the sides of the gurney that make it look discomfortingly like a cross. The restraining straps are neatly rolled. An intravenous stand is ready to carry the bottles and tubes from which and through which the lethal injection will flow. There is a phone for the final go-ahead from the Attorney General and the Governor. There is the executioner's one-way window and a two-way piece of glass through which the witnesses and the condemned can see one another. A microphone over the gurney will make the prisoner's last words audible to the witnesses. This is not an easy job. We aren't trained to do this. We shouldn't have to do it. There is one man in Texas who has continued to work feverishly and passionately to keep the execution from going forward. Robert McGlasson, an Atlanta-based attorney, has been Mario Marquez's lawyer for the last five years. This is not easy to do. especially not today. McGlasson spent the morning in Houston still trying to get people to listen to him to convince the courts that they should not execute a retarded man. Typing last-minute appeals and petitions. We have that pending and uh, we feel strongly about it. We feel like uh, there's a good chance that the lieutenant governor will uh, see this for what it is. It's all been done. We're just now sort of uh, having to count the hours. Constantly on the phone with officials, supporters of his cause, trying to get the word out to the media. This goes beyond the bounds of decency in any civilized sense of the word. Trying to reassure his client that he has not been forgotten. Mario? Hi, it's Robert McGlasson. How are you? I just wanted to call and uh, check in on you and let you know that uh, we're still working away. We haven't heard anything. Okay. But by midday, 2.35 p.m. to be precise, he did hear some clearly bad news. This looks like this is it. What, were, were there any dissents? Supreme Court denied no dissents. But I've been telling myself uh, for several days now that uh, this was very much a long shot. Um, but, you know, Lieutenant Governor, is, it's in his hands, and uh, that's where the moral pressure should be applied, you know. But the governor's office in Texas traditionally has not given reprieves or clemency. And by okay. 4.30, McGlasson received the call from the Lieutenant Governor's office. Well, it's over. They said that the clemency had been denied as well. 
So, Mario, I just don't want to tell you, but I, I'm going to come up there and see you, okay? I'm going to just try to kind of relax and and uh, hang on there, and, and we can talk about all these things that, you know, I know you want to talk about when I get up there. And For several hours now, Marquez has been here in one of six cells in the death house. The chaplain is with him, and so are a couple of guards, there to listen to his needs, to fulfill his requests for a last meal. Mario Marquez ordered fried chicken, baked potato, and a cinnamon roll. If he wants, he can shower, listen to an old radio, have a cigarette, talk to his lawyer. McLassen can visit Marquez here, but only behind a screen. They cannot physically touch one another. It's a relatively short drive from Houston to the death house in Huntsville. The state is, is, is about to commit such a cruel and, and really truly hum, inhumane uh, act as it is tonight in, in, in what they're doing. And, uh, Marquez is scheduled to be moved from his cell to the death chamber sometime after the stroke of midnight central time. But he has been thinking about this moment for quite a long time. To me, it's going to be like going to sleep. You know, I know, I know, I know one thing that I'm, ain't going to be painful for me. I ain't going to feel nothing. You know, I already experienced that in a dream before. I had a dream a while back, you know, that I entered the chambers and uh, that I was laid down in a garney. Then they put those needles in and I died. But I did not die in pain or nothing. I just died peaceful. It's five minutes before midnight when the witnesses to the Marquez execution are escorted into a holding room of an imposing old building that is used now as a prison processing center. There are two kinds of witnesses, those who have seen an execution before and those who have not. Among our group, several of us are first timers. Three of those are already inside. Two are brothers of the condemned man. The third is his lawyer. As the witnesses are searched, more for hidden microphones than for weapons, one of the officers tells me, as we're being searched, the condemned, Mario Marquez, is having a needle inserted into his right forearm. Inside the actual execution chamber, he is strapped to a gurney, straps across his chest and waist, thighs, and shins, another strap around each ankle, both wrists strapped to boards that stick out on either side of the gurney. Texas law requires that executions be carried out on the specified day, but before the hour of sunrise. After midnight then, but before dawn. The family members and the lawyer have been kept apart from the reporters and other witnesses. But when word comes that Marquez has been secured on the gurney and that the intravenous tube has been attached to the needle in his arm, the witnesses are summoned to the death house. Marquez is lying on his back a microphone suspended over his head so that his final words can be heard in the observation room where we stand. We're just a few feet away, separated by a sheet of glass. When he tilts his head to the right, Marquez can see his brothers, armed, draped around one another, and next to them, his lawyer. Inside the execution chamber, the warden stands near the head of the condemned. The prison chaplain stands by his feet. The executioners, there are three of them, who will release a mixture of three chemicals into the IV, are invisible behind one-way glass. Much has been made of the fact that Marquez is mildly retarded with the mind of a seven-year-old, but his final words are composed and organized. He apologizes to his brothers for the pain he has caused them and the family. He apologizes to the family of the victims. 
I hold nothing against anyone, he says, not even the prosecutors. I just want to come home to him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. With that, the signal is given to the executioners. Marquez released a short explosion of breath, like an involuntary cough. That was it. That was all there was to be seen. The brothers wept softly. The attorney, Robert McGlasson, looked crushed. Inside the chamber, there was no movement for several minutes. Then a doctor examined the body and at 12.21 pronounced Mario Marquez dead. Compared to the death that he inflicted on his victims, Marquez died painlessly and apparently at peace with himself and his God. Life in prison seems a far more devastating punishment than this relatively tranquil death. As we left the death house on the way back to our own lives, there was absolute silence. If I had been expecting a moment of revelation, it did not come.